Well, hello to everybody. I will get the workshop one started for the risk assessment, recall and referral quality improvement project in general practice, because I can see we've got uh, 28 participants coming along. So thank you all very much for giving up a bit of your Wednesday evening. When I find all my buttons, I would like to make an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the peoples of the Kulin Nations as the traditional custodians of the lands on which the work in the community takes place and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and pay respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in the session with us today. And we recognise the disproportionate impact of CVD and type 2 diabetes in the Indigenous community, including high prevalence, earlier onset and poor prognosis. A couple of housekeeping uh, points. Please ensure you've joined the session using the same name as your event registration. Um, we'll be using Zoom's participant list to mark attendance. And if you're not sure if your name matches, please send a chat message to Northwest Melbourne Education and it'll come up looking like this. Um, the session is being recorded and will be shared with project participants. And please let us know if you've got any concerns. The agenda I sent out in uh, last week's um, info pack has drifted a little bit. So we'll be sticking with this agenda for tonight and hopefully we'll keep to time and be finished with a robust discussion at eight o'clock. And we have in the team is myself, Marie Hunt from Northwest Melbourne Primary Health Network. Def Germano is doing a great um, job as backup support. Emily Dixon and Phil Flanagan are project officers who will be helping in the project. So you'll be hearing from them in the activity phases of the project. We've got Dr. Ralph Audem in the room with us. Eleni Kayas from Diabetes Victoria um, for the LIFE program. And we have Penn coming in to talk about their top bar new release. And again, we'll finish off with that discussion and next steps on getting started. The quality improvement is a pilot project and we're very grateful to have the funding from the Victorian Department of Health. It's uh, really to focus, as you all know, on CVD risk and type two diabetes risk. The aim of the project is to increase awareness of these diseases and understanding the uptake of patient risk assessments, and earlier management support and referral, referral to lifestyle risk reduction services and programs. As we said, we've touched on the objectives throughout the um, EOI uh, um, and initiation of the project stages. So I'll just quickly touch on the outcomes. And that really is to get an increased understanding of CVD and diabetes and early identification assessment and disease prevention supports on offer, increase the proportion of patients identified who were not known to be at risk of these diseases, and increase proportion of practices undertaking the CVD risk assessments, MBS item number 699 and 177, and it's in red because we probably, for those who don't know, we won't know until June 30 if they these item numbers will be continuing as an MBS item support. Um, we'll certainly give you plenty of information if, um, if and when we find out the, the life or otherwise of those, pro, uh, those um, item numbers. You'll see throughout the presentation, we've just highlighted in red so that you are aware um, going, down in, going into the future if those item numbers do not, do disappear you'll have to make adjustments. Our monthly, um, uh, the, the project takes a three workshop structure and we're over here at workshop one. Thank you everybody who's completed the project survey. I think at last look, there was only one or two that haven't completed the pre-project survey. So we'll be reaching out to you to try and gather that information. Workshop two and workshop three, 
will be confirmed for the month of August and October, respectively. We'll finish off with the uh, project in November with um, a another set of post-project survey data. Activity periods really will be where myself, Emily and Phil will reach out to practices and help you along the journey in meeting those objectives and outcomes. Again, this is um, the timeline. There's nothing new that um, to cover here, apart from we'll collect and submit some baseline data. Your project officers will help you with establishing those data points. What do you need to do to get the most out of the project? Provide some protected time to your staff. It'd be great if we can get um, GPs, nurses and practice managers to attend um, the project officer support meetings. We've touched on the workshops. Complete at least three PDSA cycles around um, improvements. And uh, Ralph will certainly speak with his expertise on what that looks like in that, um, that methodology of PDSA cycle structure. We're hoping that two of these will be based on the decision assist map, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and the pen cat recipes. Collect and submit your data, your project data, and complete the pre and post project surveys, because we don't know if you don't tell us if we're hitting the mark. So, I would like now to introduce Dr. Ralph Audem. Ralph is Professor Audem. He works for the University of Melbourne in the Department of General Practice, as well as being a very busy GP in Carlton and North, Carlton and North Fitzroy. He also sits on our Peak Clinical Council and he's been a GP advisor to the Heart Foundation, helping to form those new guidelines of 2018. And he's a clinical contributor to PHN Heart Failure Health Pathway and the AF Heart Pathway. Ralph is a speaker on various topics, particularly diabetes, QR, as um, a co presenter with Magna Zaban. jump on now there we yeah, go yeah so look thanks for that and we're going to have to update that because I, I i'm only in carlton these days and i'm no longer on the clinical advisory committee but for all those who possibly can't think it's too small i'm actually wearing a national heart foundation shirt so i thought that might just help uh, as we sort of start working but heart disease is common um, and so if you look at this in the acute coronary events with time it's going down but of course population is going up and we're getting an age population but really you know at this point in time we're on average there's about four in every thousand patients that you will look after that will actually end up having a some sort of an acute event so if you work out you know depending on where you are but let's say if an average gp has 1500 patients you could expect about six events every year so we can make a difference about that. So, so what we do really does count. And so if you go to the next slide. Oops, sorry. That's right. There we go. I lost um, my mouse. You know, the impacts of heart disease um, is large. And what I want to highlight is that 25% of people have three or more risk factors. So if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see that sort of in a, in a graphical format. So you know, there's a significant proportion of people that have a, a quite a, a collection of risk factors that we can do something about. That's important because if you go to the next slide, we know that all those people who um, either at high risk, um, you know, or have even had an event, most actually don't reach their LDL target. Now, I know LDL targets has been a bit of a contra controversial thing, you know, because, you know, some guidelines say less than two, some say less than 1.8. But for people at high risk or who've had an event, we really should be targeting an LDL less than 1.8. And the theory goes behind it that at that sort of level, you'll see regression of plaque, which, which is a wonderful thing. And in fact, in people who 
go on to have further events despite being a target or really high risk, we would actually try and get them down to an LDL of less than 1.4. The other thing is that people who survive an infarct, many will have a recurrent event. With, so we can see here, it's about 20% within the first 12 months. And that next event, event may in fact be fatal. So what we need to do is, is think of these group of people as self-identifying as being really high risk. And we can change the trajectory of their health. But we've got to get in early. And, and that's the key message I'm sure that you'll come across throughout tonight. If we go to the next slide, so if you go, sorry, and again. So this um, was a study that was done in an emergency department in a Queensland tertiary hospital. And they looked at all people who came in with an acute coronary syndrome. So you can see, you know, 35% of people had already had an event. So when I look at that 35%, I start to think along the lines of, well, that's a failure. We've missed the boat. We should have been able to prevent that. Then we go along to those at high risk. So you see one in four who presented had a high risk. Now you may think, well, gee, well, 26% were low risk. But the number of people at low risk, of course, is much greater. So when we think of high risk patients, that 23%, the number needed to treat is far lower. The reason why I'm harping on this, because if you go to the next slide, in that group of patients, right? So you can see in those people that on the right-hand side who've had a, a, some sort of cardiac event previously, right? Just over half were on what we would call evidence-based therapy. So that meant nearly half weren't being treated appropriately. So you know, and you can see it goes down to incomplete and right down to some people who are no therapy at all. And, and look, I have had patients who've, you know, had their event, had their stent put in, they were told they were cured and so they stopped taking all the medication. So, you know, we need to be really aware that this group of people, we need to target because they've already self-identified. But interestingly enough, if you go to the other side, so these are people at high risk, right? So you, you do your heart health, you know, your, your heart risk calculation, and only 20% were on the therapy that would be indicated by being high risk. And 48%, so half, half of the people at high risk of a cardiovascular event weren't on anything. So again, these people, high risk, we can do something about them. We can actually, you know, prevent their, you know, their, their cardiac event if we get them early enough and on the right treatment. So, you know, that's a really telling slide. But if we move along, now this is uh, work done by Charlotte Hesp, who's um, a GP in Sydney, and she had access to a large general practice database. And again, looking at the, the, the column down the middle, so these are people who have had an event. And if you look at them, 20% were on no risk lowering medications, nothing, all right? But and people who were all on all guideline treatments was 56.8%. So, you know, again, that's not a great, you know, uh, Study. I mean, it's not, well, it's not a great thing to see. We, we should be doing better for, for this group of people because we can prevent them dying and, you know, certainly um, improve their health. And then if you look at their blood pressure, um, only 38% were at their target. So again, you know, this is our domain. As GPs and general practices, we can do something about that. But tonight we're talking about prevention. So before they get, so the middle column is all about secondary prevention. But look at this. These people identified at being high risk, only one in four were on, well, one in four weren't on anything. So a little bit better than maybe the, the hospital one, but gee, one in four. Um, and again, uh, when you look down to the targets, you know, 57% uh, were at target for their blood pressure. 
um, but only 36 were at target for the LDLs. So we can do better and we should do better uh, because it makes a difference to outcomes for our patients. Again, so the next slide. And, you know, the evidence goes on. So this is from Busselton, which is a um, town south of Perth. And again, if you look at, well, I'll, I'll leave out the, the previous event because again, it's showing the same sort of things about people not achieving targets. But if you look at the second from the right, this is high primary CVD risk. And you can already see um, that in terms of lipid lowering medication, you know, 26.5%, blood pressure 35%, and only 16% on both. So this is real live data, data from general practices. Um, and again, it's important that we, we, we tackle this in a really systematic way, which is why I'm thrilled that the PHN are doing a, what, what I would call a quality improvement program. Next. And it's interesting, when they started trying to tease out why it is that people don't persist with treatment, why clinicians don't initiate treatment. And, you know, there are a whole lot of intersecting sort of reasons that sit behind this. But unless, you know, but when you take a focus on actually doing something like this, it often crystallizes the things that are where the gaps are and then allows you to be proactive. But communication amongst the team, I think is really, really important. And under the health system, uh, the visit planning, you know, again, we have item numbers that allow us to do what I would call planned care or planned visits, rather than people coming in with a problem that you're trying to deal with, and then you try and add on your preventive sort of activities. So I'm very much around that, um, that planned review of patients. Next. Moving on to diabetes. Now I'm going really quick because at, at the end of the day, what I'd like to do is have a discussion with you all about how you find things. But, you know, this is um, uh, to do with diabetes. And you can see that, you know, the incidence of diabetes over the, the decades, so from, you know, the 90s to the 2015s, you know, you've seen the, 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 the sort of people, the, the, the burden of diabetes increase you know, up to 13.2%. So one in eight for people over 65. And interesting enough, predominantly men, but, you know, women are there as well. And yes, it is something that's more common as we get older, but we are seeing the younger groups increasing faster and faster. Yep, perfect timing. I saw the O go down. So, um, and of course, we know there are certain groups that are, more prone. So if you're working at the sort of the northern, northwest corner of the PHN, you'll know that people born overseas are at a much higher risk, you know, double those compared to your Anglo-Saxon sort of uh, grouping almost. And people in lower or the more disadvantaged areas have a higher burden of this disease. Um, and interesting enough, people who already have a disability again, are more prone to getting diabetes. So it's, it's a huge population. And again, if we can stop diabetes, because you know, once they get diabetes, it can cause so many issues if we can prevent them getting it. And we've got great ways of preventing diabetes. And you're going to hear from one of those processes later on. And, and the beauty is it works. We, we, we know it works in controlled trials, but with the LIFE program, it was actually done in the real world and it still works. So it works really well. Anyway, next slide. Um, I'm a, I get a bit passionate about this. So if you just click to the next slide, the, the thing, and again, the thing about diabetes is that there's a long lead time. So as with heart disease, we can work on risk factors. And so if we tackle the risk factors, we can eventually, we can actually hopefully stop the event. With diabetes, it's exactly the same. We have a lead time that can be many years. If we capture those people when they've got residual beta cells, when they're actually, you know, when they can able to make changes, because small changes at the beginning 
can really add value later on. So, you know, up to five years beforehand, we know people will be getting it. And we know, we know there are certain groups that are such high risk that you really want to be working with them, you know, you know well before they even could even think of getting diabetes, so, you know, think of gestational diabetes. So if you go to the next slide, so, so the key here is that both these diseases can be identified before the disease emerges. Both of them have evidence-based interventions that can change the trajectory of our patients. And so that will mean, you know, decreasing your cardiovascular events that will you know, prevent getting diabetes. And of course, huge other spin-offs around overall health. Oh, and I know I went through this really quickly, but I'm sure many of you have heard this before. But the, the key issue is what we want you to do. What are we asking of you? And so rather than, you know, taking that sort of ad hoc, I'll, I'll capture patients when they come in with something else. What we're really asking you to do is to think about systematically looking for patients, which you're going to hear from Penn later on how you can do that. Think of a process of how you're going to identify those patients, get them into the practice, do some sort of assessment, and then put them on treatment. And what we want you to do is actually monitor the number of patients. Because again, what you do makes a huge difference in the long run. Um, so find them, support them, help them, you know, the five A's, get them um, into that sort of mindset that they need to do something. But the key, and I'll keep going back to this, is it's about being proactive and systematic. Doing it ad hoc just doesn't work. You know, I've been a GP for more years than I'd like to admit to. And when I'm busy and I'm seeing patients coming in with their problems, I often don't have time to do a lot of this stuff. So having an activated team around you, which can be your know, reception, it can be your nurses, you know, uh, you can actually do this without actually increasing a burden on yourself and you'll actually make a difference. So next slide. So the importance, data. So, and I would encourage people to ensure that they put the, you know, readings in the right place. So things like blood pressure, record them in the blood pressure section. Do take your weights. I mean, because if you don't record them there, when you try and do a search and see how you're going, it makes it really difficult. I mean, with pathology, it's a little bit easier because they automatically get input into uh, where you're going. If you use the um, uh, uh, cardiovascular risk calculator, if you use the one that comes with your e-health record, it automatically gets recorded in the notes. So then you can start searching on it. And Penn will also be able to give you some data on who to look for uh, when it comes to risk factors. But I'm sure you'll find that there will be a significant number um, who are unquantifiable because they don't have enough data. And so they're the ones that you really need to think about. Um, are we capturing the people that we need to do, uh, need to catch? Now, so once you've got the data, see, then you can sit down and you can say, well, you know, well, when we did um, this in Broadie, uh, we had, what, 450 patients with type 2 diabetes. But, you know, if you then look at how many people who had pre-diabetes or at high risk, it was, well, the problem we had was we didn't record it as well as what we thought. And so we had to start, you know, making sure that when people came in, that we did record all the things that we needed to. But then that allowed us to think, okay, who do we call in? And we started, you know, with people like gestational diabetes. Um, it's an easy one, or people with PCOS. But everyone will be different. You can choose what's important for you, but we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But having that data there is really important. The pen tool is is an absolute godsend when it comes to this is so important because it allows you to pick patients who are at risk, but it allows you to 
break them down into certain categories so that when you're recalling them, you're not recalling 100 at a time. You might say, well, I'm going to recall maybe 10 or 20 of the highest risk and start with them, see how it goes. And then you broaden it. So, and, and I must admit, I always love with the start with number one, put them through the paces, see how your processes went, what needs to be tweaked, then go to 10, see how that goes, and then expand it out until you get into your whole practice. Oh, sorry, next slide. I was trying to put the slide forward myself. So when you get the data, you know, the first thing you've got to ask is, well, is that what I expected? Because I can tell you that uh, having done this in the collaboratives, and let me say, when the collaboratives did this for prevention, the uptake of the cardiac risk checks and, and the diabetes prevention was fantastic because people had a focus on it. But everyone who looks at their data says, oh, no, that can't be right because they don't think there'll be that many people at risk or who haven't had anything done or haven't had their blood pressure or their weight checked for a while. So do look at the data, think, well, where are the gaps? What it is we can do better? Then what to do with the data? So you, you heard me talk about maybe picking a patient first, run them through the process to make sure that it works well, and then maybe open it up to, you know, maybe 10 a week, you know, and the process might be, well, in our practice, it's the nurses have, you know, we've, we've done the search, I've given a list to my, uh, to my practice nurse, you know, I tell them to sort it from the highest risk to the lowest, pick maybe five or 10, send out letters or give them a call, get them to come in. And then depending how you do it, you might be doing there's a health assessment or you might be doing there's a heart health check. If they haven't had their bloods done for a while, when you send out the invite, you might send out a, a pathology test. So when they come in, they've got everything done. So it saves them coming back multiple times. But nurses, and, and they all hate me for this because they're a great asset and we need to use them more. So we need to get them working harder now. And everybody goes, oh, but we're working hard enough. With this, you need to start saying, well, they will actually make you money. So they'll actually make it, uh, your, your practice more viable, but you do have to give them protected time. You can't get them to do this as an add-on to everything else because they're so busy as it is. So think about protected time. And let me say, once it starts to happen and it becomes a well-oiled machine, it, it just works so well. Um, and, you know, you will have the outcomes and, you know, you can give yourself a pat on the back when that starts to happen. Anyway, next slide. So I'm always passionate about this. Now, the PHN has a booklet on quality improvement. It's a great booklet. It has all the things you need to do in it. So download it, have a read, you know, it's there for you. And, you know, you can then use that to step through each of the steps. Um, and, you know, once you've then identified and you've called your patients in, well, in Victoria, we're lucky. We've got the LIFE program. It works. It, you know, the, uh, I, the data that I had, which is going back quite a few years now, but a, at least a 40% reduction in risk of going on to type 2 diabetes. So that was nearly half. So the, it's a, a great intervention. And it's amazing that they can achieve it with so few sessions. It's just, but anyway, uh, don't get me started. Um, but the other thing is, I want you to then track what you're doing. So, you know, if you're using the heart health checks, you look at how many heart health checks you have done maybe in a week, um, and then look back and say, well, am I happy with that number? Do I want to do more? What can we do to do more? You know, how many, um, you know, 45 to 49 health checks that we've done. So unless you look at what you're doing, you will never know the outcome of your intervention. And of course, the beauty of that is, is if you know you're doing those health assessments, you know, they are a, a great way of, again, making your practice much more sustainable. And, and I, I have no qualms talking about the money because what we do in general practice has to be sustainable. That's really important. There's no point doing something if it's going to make us go bust. But you need to do that because you need to 
improvement in what you're doing. You know, if, if you know, because when you start to see the numbers change, you know, you get that real enthusiasm. Say, well, yeah, no, this is great. I'm actually making a difference. Anyway, so uh, next slide. So one thing that we did know in the collaboratives, um, and this is, uh, I hope the GPs don't mind me saying it, but this is a fault of GPs. We love to do everything all at once. And we just often take on too much in one go. And so the, the key here, and this is why the PDSA cycles are so good and the book is good, because it will actually tell you to do, just start with something small, see how it goes, then look at it. Did it do what I wanted? If it did, good, move to the next PDSA. And if you keep on doing that, what will happen is you'll achieve your goal, your overarching goal, but you're not trying to do everything in a shotgun approach, everything all at once, and then feeling overwhelmed and lost. Um, we, at very first uh, collaborative, this is one of the issues we found. So keep it small, small changes, ongoing, and you'll eventually get there. So, and then with the PDSAs, you know, what you're thinking you, you might want to do, do this at a practice meeting because, you know, our reception staff, our practice managers, our practice nurses, all know our practice as well. And, and they often have great ideas, you know, left of field sometimes, but great ideas. So do involve everyone in the practice, you know, have a meeting, tell them, you know, what it is you're doing, why you're doing it. And often they're really enthusiastic. And you may find that you have a, a receptionist who's particularly interested really important you know document what you're doing what your pdsas were because what you can do is if you share them then people can see what you've done and they'll often say ah i can do that and that will, will you know they'll steal it as they would say but they pinch it and try it so we really do want you to share your successes and even some of your failures you know why it didn't work because you know, this is what a community of practice is about. It's learning from each other. And honestly, we, if you have this many GPs, practice managers and practice nurses in a room, we can solve anything. Yeah, next slide. Sorry, I get a little bit passionate about this. So this was just the whole thing, you know, you can't eat an elephant all at once, but gee, if you take it small chunks at a time, you'll eventually get there. Okay. These are the, the foundation. You'll see this in the booklet. So, you know, you have your overarching what it is that you're trying to do. So we're trying to prevent people having their first cardiac event. We're trying to prevent diabetes. You know, you'll do them separately. How will you know that a change is improvement? And so, you know, that may well be um, increased number of people with at high risk with an LDL less than 1.8, or it might be the number of people with um, an A1C between 6 and 6.5 who I've referred to the LIFE program. So, you know, you, you'll need to work through what it is that you can capture easily because we, we want the data to be easy to see, easy to collect so you can see what changes you make actually do make a difference. And then the third part down here, this is the doing part. What is it that you can do that will make an improvement? This is where you get your whole practice, sit down and say, right, what is it that we can do that will, you know, decrease or, you know, improve the number of people who are at risk of diabetes getting the LIFE program? And you sit down there and you just ask, well, what do you think we should do? Well, we need to identify people. Well, we could put up posters. We could, you know, run, you know, some sort of a, a webinar for our patients. We could put something on the TV screen. I mean, it could be anything and everything. Um, but then what you need to do is you break them down further. And so when you actually do something, it's a quick, short, sharp cycle. Yep. You know, um, let's say, oh, we need to see all the people who have a cholesterol, you know, greater than, let's say, 6.5, let's say greater than 7, not on a statin. So you're right, you do that, you can do that within a few days, you look at the result. 
And then you can say, wow, I never realized. And then you work, work through with it. So again, what you do down there is very individual. It's about you and your practice. That's why this sort of process works so well, because it's not us telling you, this is what you need to do. It's saying, well, we've identified this that's important to us. And then away you go. So it's actually very relevant to you. Next. So you've heard me talk about the team. Um, and the biggest issue that we've found in the past is that the general practitioner who takes this on thinks that they have to take the lead, have to keep a track on everything, um, and often end up doing far too much. I don't know about you, I don't have the time. Um, and, you know, our time is often better spent looking after the patients. A lot of this background work, this so coordination activity, this can be done by your practice manager, your practice nurses, and some of your receptionists will be really keen to be involved in things like this. So the, 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 the key here is delegating so you don't burn yourself out. That's really key because, you know, we're, we're doing a marathon, not a sprint. We want you to be able to make changes that are sustainable, that becomes part of your practice. So delegation and then protected time for whoever you delegate to. Don't ask them to just add it on to their already busy schedule. They need time to be able to work with this, but it will be time well spent because you know, there's a whole lot of effects that will come from this that you'll really enjoy. Next. Oh, so there you go. I did that really quick. Um, I hope it wasn't too quick, but you know what I'm really keen on is hearing from you at the end, because at the end of the day, this is about you, not about me. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. That was a fabulous presentation. Certainly your passion and knowledge really just come through loud and clear. And also we're just so fortunate for having your expertise and that passion and knowledge, but understanding what's happening in general practice at that practice level, talking about teams and supporting each other to get those, um, those changes that we're really looking for. I might just take this moment to remind everyone if they can keep on mute, there's a little bit of background um, noise there. So if we can all just double check, that would be fabulous. And now I would like to um, have a big welcome to Eleni Kayas from Diabetes Victoria, who will take us through the life program that uh, Ralph has touched on. So there we go. I will find the next slide. Thanks, Marie, for the introduction. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation who a traditional custodian of the land on which I'm gathering today. I would also like to pay my respects to any elders past and present and any Aboriginal people who may be here today. Next slide, please. <laughs> that's, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Um, yes, thank you, Ralph, for a bit of introduction to the LIFE program. So some of you may have heard of us. We are a lifestyle modification program for your patients who are at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So we are funded by the Victorian uh, State Government and managed by Diabetes Victoria. And we are a free program for your patients who are identified at high risk. Uh, we are an evidence-based program. So essentially we have qualified health professionals that really um, try to motivate your patients to reduce their modifiable risk factors to help reduce their risk of these chronic diseases. So really uh, there are seven sessions that are run over 12 months and essentially we cover topics like nutrition, physical activity, stress management and help your patients set goals. So really um, our program is underpinned um, by behaviour change principles and we really assist your patients to develop specific goals to help them achieve uh, risk modification. Next slide, please. 
So delivery of the program, we do have quite a few modes of delivery, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so we have group courses, um, which we do deliver all across Victoria, particularly in Northwest Melbourne um, region. We offer our program in language. So to your culturally and linguistically diverse groups, so we deliver the program in Arabic, Chinese, Vietnamese, and in plain English. We also deliver the program over the phone via telephone health coaching. And we do have an Ab Aboriginal um, version life called Road to Good Health. Next slide, please. Uh, so essentially this is the what the group course looks like. And apologies that the presentation isn't too clear. Um, but hopefully um, I talk you through it and it's a little bit more clearer to everyone. Um, so we do have an introductory session, which does go for an hour. And really, again, that's that one-on-one -on -one session um, that your patient will have with our health professional to help them develop their SMART goals and really get some baseline data on how they're going. Um, then we have session one, uh, which is the week commencing the program, which really provides them with an overview of the program and really assisting them to understand what is type two diabetes, what is heart disease, what is uh, stroke and how, and you know, why is it important that you're here to reduce your risk? You know, why has your GP or practice nurse referred you into this program? Um, at week two, we do a session on healthy eating. So if the health professional actually delivering the course isn't a dietitian, this session is actually co-facilitated by a dietitian. Um, and what they do is they go through, you know, label reading with them. They assist them to understand what they're currently doing and how they can achieve their goal through um, recipe modification and the like. We then have um, at week four of the program, uh, which is session three on physical activity. Again, if the health professional is an exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist, it is co-facilitated by one. So it's really important to note, we do have experts here guiding your patients to help them with risk, this risk modification. Um, then we do have week six, a session four, um, which is on wellbeing. Um, so, you know, we all know we can tell our patients, eat well, um, exercise, but if you're not uh, practicing mental health hygiene, it's really difficult to implement all of these strategies. So we really do, uh, sorry, last, back to the last slide. <laughs> um, so it's really important to manage that. Um, and we do talk about sleep as well. We then have session five, which is on progress um, to really understand how to manage setbacks and any barriers that they have overcome. So that's the six month mark. So you can probably note here that the first few weeks are within uh, two weeks of each other, the sessions, because we're providing them with all the content. Um, that we really want them to go back um, into their everyday life and implement these changes and goals. So six months we check on them and at 12 months we check on them to really see how they're going and then we support them to overcome any barriers that they might be uh, facing and um, how to uh, live a healthy lifestyle ongoing. Next slide please. So telephone health coaching again it's the seven sessions over the 12 months but it's a little bit different to group course. So this option will provide your patients um, with a one-on-one -on -one session with the health professional over the phone um, it is very much underpinned by um, behaviour change principles and really it's more of a focus on a specific aspect that they might want to talk about. So it could be nutrition and some goals relating to that, uh, physical activity and wellbeing. So the health coach will really um, discover what their goals are and just assist them through their journey. Um, and again, that's at seven sessions and they range from around 20 minutes to 45 minutes. Next slide, please. So what have we achieved? Um, I know Ralph has ha did go on about how successful we have been, which is great. We have been around for more than 15 years and we do regularly evaluate our program as a result. Um, so here are some evaluation results from 2021. I do like to harp on about the uh, modifiable risk factor, risk factors being reduced. Um, so I focused on a few here. Uh, we all know that weight and waist circumference is a risk factor um, for both type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So you can see some significant decrease in both weight and waist circumference for both the group course and telephone health coaching. A little bit more significant there for the telephone health coaching service. Um, I guess it's important to note here too 
that not every participant or your patients that actually do the life program are overweight or need to lose weight. Um, so these results are reflective of that and they are very much an average of um, the participants that complete the program every year. So we've had around 75,000 Victorians complete our program uh, since the beginning five, 15 years ago. Um, so it's really important to note that um, you know that your patients are in good hands. So we, we know that almost 96% of life participants reported making positive changes to their diet, which is great. 93% of participants reported making positive changes to physical activity and almost 97 of our life participants actually rated the program as very good or excellent. Next slide, please. So if you could, uh, Marie, sorry, click on the, the link or the, the picture should do. Yep, that should be fine. But there doesn't seem to be any audio. Has that improved at all? Has that improved at all, Melanie? Yes, it, I, uh, no, no, that's okay. We can we can skip the video for now, and I can share that um, to all interested parties after the presentation. All right, apologies there. No problem. I will need to jump back into. Oh, sorry. Uh, where did we lose it? Um, mm -mm. Maybe. Yeah. Um, that that seems to be the one where you yep, we click on that and then go to the presentation mode and return to the slide you're at. Um, yes, I think apologies. We'll just have to jump through a couple here to catch up. There we go. Thanks, yeah, Eleni. Yeah, I'm really not sure why it's not very clear, um, unfortunately. Um, it's a bit of a shame. Um, it is clear on my end, Marie, maybe it's the way that it was um, copied in. Mm. Yeah, it could be. Um, anyway, I will be, um, perhaps we could share this presentation as well with everyone after uh, this workshop, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, but so we've gone on about, I've gone on about life program. I've gone about, gone on about how um, we have improved outcomes for your patients and that we are funded by the department. So I guess it's important to know which of your patients are eligible for the program. And today we are talking about risk reduction and identification of your patients um, for primary prevention of type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Uh, so we do have an eligibility criteria for our program. So we have A, B or C, which I'll go into in the next few slides, but before I do, I'll go over the program exclusion criteria. Um, so as a prevention program, any of your patients diagnosed with diabetes, so type one or type two, um, are excluded for the from the program. Now a cardiovascular disease diagnosis within the last three months, um, because it's quite an acute uh, diagnosis there. But if you do have a patient that has been diagnosed with cardiovascular disease recently and is interested in the program, please refer them in and just let them know that in three months time, our program can contact them and enroll them into the program. Clinically active cancer um, and pregnancy, as we all know, there are contraindications there um, to what they actually might need rather than being uh, referred into a lifestyle modification program. Next slide, please. So eligibility criteria A, OSD risk and BMI. So, um, Again, today is about prevention and um, understanding who may be eligible. So if you're doing type two diabetes health assessment risks, um, so MBS items 701 and 715 in your practice, uh, some of your patients might be eligible. So anyone 18 years or over and with an OSD risk of 12 or more, so at high risk, and they need to have a BMI of 25 or more. 
Now, if your patients self-identify as being of Asian descent, so BMI of 23 or more, um, they are also accepted into our program. Next slide, please. Eligibility criteria B. Um, so I know Marie did mention that uh, the MBS item 699177 heart health check might be um, might be expiring end of June. Hopefully it does get renewed. Um, however, this could be another way that you can refer patients into eligibility criteria B. So really an absolute risk score of 10% or more for your patients who are 45 years or over or 30 years and over and of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent. Um, so really at that moderate to high risk um, when doing that um, assessment. And next slide, please. And eligibility criteria C. So any of your patients with any of these pre-existing conditions are actually eligible for our program. And I actually go over them now since they're not so clear here on uh, this presentation. So a diagnosis of cardiovascular disease, and we have a whole list of what we um, define as cardiovascular disease. Gestational diabetes diagnosis. So not currently pregnant, but they've had gestational diabetes in the previous pregnancy chronic kidney disease, uh, stage 3B, so an EGFR of 45 or less, pre-diabetes, um, impaired fasting glucose or um, impaired glucose tolerance, polycystic ovarian syndrome, familial hypercholesterolemia, um, serum total cholesterol, cholesterol greater than 7.5, and a systolic blood pressure of greater than 180 or a diastolic blood pressure greater than 110. So there's quite a bit... Um, so eligibility criteria is quite extensive there as well. So you might find, you know, when you're doing your team care arrangements, GP management care plans, or other types of consults, so you might be seeing a patient for something completely unrelated, but you do know that your patient has had gestational diabetes. This might be a really good prompt for you then to refer into the LIFE program. Um, and some of you, you know, may be thinking, well, you know, if I've referred them into a, a care plan or team care arrangement and they're seeing a health professional for those sessions over the 12 months, do I really need to refer them into life? Well, it really is a complement to those individualised sessions that they will be receiving. I mean, the more the better to promote lifestyle change um, and risk reduction um, to improve their health outcomes. Next slide, please. So how do you refer into our program? I guess is maybe the next question that you're asking yourselves. Um, so we do have a life referral form. Now, this life referral form, as you can see here on the screen, hopefully you can, um, is available as a template um, on Medical Director Best Practice Z Medigeni. Now, the patient details and referred details are auto-populated for you. Um, you do need to confirm eligibility, A, B or C, and ensure your patient doesn't uh, meet the exclusion criteria. Of course, obtain your patient consent. Their information is being released to Diabetes Victoria to contact them and enrol them into our program. You then um, do need to send some pathology through with the referral. So we do require either fasting blood glucose or HbA1c and full blood lipids, just to make sure that your patient isn't currently living with diabetes. Um, and then rest assured, Diabetes Victoria will contact your patient within uh, one to two business days to enrol them into the program. And then you as the referrer will actually be notified um, of the outcome of the referral. So um, it's also really important to note that we have been working with uh, PENCS who are here today. Um, we'll be talking through um, the work that we've done. So really we wanna make it as easy as possible for practices um, to practice um, referring, of course, into lifestyle modification programs and practicing prevention. Um, so we have worked with PenCS uh, to develop a LIFE program top bar app. If you do have um, the top bar app with CAT4 uh, to identify your patients live in consultation that are eligible for our program. So a pop-up will come up um, and you will see if they're eligible via A, B or C or all. And um, we have uh, the lovely Shafia going to be speaking to you more from PenCS about that. We've also developed some recipes uh, with PenCS to help you with retrospective recall of your patients um, through the eligibility A, B or C. So hopefully we've made the process really easy for you um, when you're seeing your patients or if you want to retrospectively recall your patients into practice um, that you can refer them on to life and help reduce their risk. Um, of developing these chronic diseases. Next slide, please. 
Um, I think it was really important um, that Ralph noted, you know, the, the financial incentive and of making um, chronic disease prevention viable in your practice. And, and we do appreciate that too. We appreciate your time. Um, although we know a, a lot of you here are passionate about prevention and it's fantastic, you know, we do want to make sure that it is financial, financially viable for your practice. So we do offer a financial incentive for your practice to refer into the LIFE program. So it's up to $45 plus GST, and this is broken down in two installments. So $20 plus GST for referring an eligible patient into the program, and then a further $25 plus GST once your patient then completes the first session of the program. Next slide, please. So thank you very much. Um, hopefully you found that presentation useful. Um, here are my details, please note them down. Um, I'll be in touch with Marie anyway to circulate my details. Um, I will be on maternity leave at the end of this month, um, but we do have the lovely Carrie who will be replacing me and um, all of her details will be provided to you as well. Should you require support, have any questions, I'm here to support you through this referral process. Thank you. And look, do you mind if I just jump in here? So one of the things why life works, it's because it's a coordinated, defined program. And what we found was that when you refer people to individual dietitians and or physios or exercise physiologists, they get one part of the program. But the LIFE program is set on behaviour change principles and it's got a solid base to it. So that's why referring to life is still the best way if you want to prevent diabetes. Absolutely, the evidence is there. So I just wanted, I wasn't sure if Eleni was a little bit too shy to say how good the program is, but it is important that you realise that that coordinated program is key. Exactly, Ralph. I think that's um, very well well put. And I know that um, Eleni was talking to me in the development of this project of the um, the, the groups in language uh, were you know having some fabulous results. So certainly for practices out there who have um, patient populations that could benefit from from um, a language group would be a, definitely reach out to life. Thank you, Marie. I will just spend a moment talking about the decision assist tool that you can see up on the um, screen now that we're piloting as a part of this project. This we're hoping to get all feedback from it, please. And we'll gather that up at the end and as you're going through the project. This is designed to really sit on your, your um, desktops as a point of um, a point of contact reminder for the project, which really it's something of a catch-all for the whole project. It starts with finding patients at risk, and we've been talking about those pen recipes for CVD and type 2 diabetes, and where they, how patients may present, and then considerations for um, conversations with practice, so with patients. So we kind of see this, hopefully you'll be able to trial it it's sitting at your desktop, you've got a patient that's come through and you're wanting to talk about modifiable um, risk factors. You're talking about non-modifiable risk factors and remembering always to measure, record and treat to target. And then some um, ask and record again, consider uh, using health pathways and consider is this patient a good candidate for yearly recall and assessment so building up those risk registers of patients that are really under the pen really help underpin systems changes again heart health and diabetes assessments noting the MBS item numbers will keep you up to date and you'll hear about them in the the news feeds anyway um, through PHNs type 2 diabetes risk assessment tool. Uh, Eleni's touched on the OSD risk tool and your health assessments, GPMPs, team, cares, team care arrangements, and then diet lifestyle advice. A little bit there, if you're getting stuck with somebody at your the nurse or doctor, you know, what are you going to talk about? How are you going to, to broach 
um, some of these these points. You might be just touching on them or patients it may be a longer conversation or consult that you really want to get into um, some of these areas of modifiable risk factors more more um, extensively and then who to refer to just keeping this is all on the one page to just remind you um, the extent of and breadth of the project and um, where you can send patients to. There's more information at the Heart Foundation, Diabetes Australia, all these links will be alive. Life Program we've talked about and Health Pathways has a wealth of other community health services, exercise, fitness programs, smoking cessation, overweight and um, alcohol use and, and drugs of dependence and uh, sorry, alcohol use and dependence. Some um, helpful pathways there priority populations, of course, there are MBS item numbers to help support your care there. And I need to tell myself next slide, please, because I will jump to Health Pathways and Stephanie Gimano from Northwest Melbourne will spend a moment talking about Health Pathways. Thanks so much, Marie. Um, just a bit of a pulse check. Does, um, Everyone in the room or practice, do your practices currently use or um, have access to health pathways? If you can put your virtual hand up or even your physical hand, um, just let me know, just to kind of gauge if uh, practices or your practice is already familiar in using health pathways. We've got a couple of hands, that's great. Yep, thank you for those in the room. Um, and for those um, where health pathways um, might be new um, for you, um, in, in um, I guess, addition to the support uh, tools that um, we've spoken about today, um, Health Pathways Melbourne is a clinical management and referral resource that's designed to be used uh, by clinicians, so in primary care during a consultation. So the idea is if it gives clinicians a single website to access uh, clinical referral pathways and resources, um, at your fingertips. So pathways are localised to our region, so particularly the referral information. Um, so each uh, region across Victoria has localised pathways um, that is applicable for, for where you're working and where your patient um, is needing to access care. Um, each pathway provides a, a clear, concise um, guidance for assessing and managing patients with a particular symptom or condition. Um, and they're designed or they're evidence-based or evidence-informed um, that are designed by um, a, a network of subject matter experts and hospitals. So they're in, designed in collaboration um, by local GPs, um, working in partnerships with specialists as well from um, uh, multiple uh, hospitals in our region, allied health and nurses and other health professionals as well. So Marie mentioned um, a few of the health pathways that um, are on the slide before on that diagram map, but some include um, the community health services, exercise, exercise and fitness programs, uh, smoking cessation, um, nutrition pathways, management of overweight and obesity um, in adults. There's a pathway for lifestyle and preventative care, and there's also a pathway uh, for alcohol use and dependence. Um, the way clinicians can access is, is via online. It's just a, um, a web-based tool. Um, and we can provide you quick and easy access if um, the PHN just provides you with a, a link that you can bookmark and access any time. You just jump in there, type in the symptom or condition you're interested in and um, check out the, the, the pathway um, and the relevant information that you need there. So throughout this program, Marie, Emily um, and Phil here online, they'll connect with you um, to get your practice set up um, and can go through health pathways with you if you have any other questions about that one. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Now we'd like to introduce uh, Shafia from Penn CS to talk through the uh, PenCat Live Top Bar release. Thank you, Marie. Um, sorry, I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Uh, advance apology if you hear any background noise. Uh, sorry, it's 7 p.m. here at Sydney, and uh, it's a wonderful. Uh, I will share my screen and 
uh, talk through a PowerPoint presentation. If you could stop your screen and we can just um, right. Um, okay. Let's see. All right. Is that coming through, Steph? Oh, Lovely. Perfect. Lovely. Great. Uh, before I start the presentation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which uh, I'm uh, doing this uh, training session and uh, pay my respect to past, present and emerging elders. So today I'll be talking about the live program Topper app and cat recipes, uh, which uh, recently have been developed in a collaboration with um, the fellows around here. Thank you very much, Alini, for the opportunity that you have uh, provided Penn with. Uh, in, to assist you further in terms of life program. So the agenda that the, of the PowerPoint presentation, I'll just go through a background of life on the life program, introduction to top bar, uh, life program map in top bar, um, just, you know, sample overview screenshot, introduction to CAT, uh, the CAT recipes, and then where can you get support in, from PenCS. Right, um, so I'm not really going to talk uh, too much about the life program. Um, I think Alini has very well covered uh, that section, but um, in terms of how important uh, it is, and um, that is the reason why we collaborated uh, 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 for this program and developed this app to further assist uh, clinicians. So as Dr. Raf also mentioned that, you know, we're very strict on time in terms of patients coming in and, you know, and so Penn is all about assisting clinicians and healthcare providers at the point of care or to, you know, uh, improve workflows, improve clinical workflows and making uh, sure that, you know, a doctor can provide more time to the patients and have uh, and can do all the important work side by side as well. So, um, so jumping directly on top bar. Um, so those of you who are not aware what Tobar is, and I'm not going to do a live demo of the app today. We will be providing a online training uh, session, uh, which would cover every aspect of the app and how it would button and how every button functions for the app. But this presentation is more about overview, what it looks like and what it does and uh, et cetera. So um, for those who don't know what Tobar is, Tobar is basically our a uh, clinical decision support tool uh, that assists uh, healthcare providers at the point of care um, so for opportunistic care. And uh, if you see the black bar, um, that is basically top bar, which sits on top of an individual uh, clinical information system. Currently, top bar is compatible with best practice, medical director, and ZMED. And if you have a CAT plus license from your PHN, top bar is then complementary uh, for you as well. Um, in case you do not have top bar installed in your practice, um, in the end of this PowerPoint presentation, I will further talk about the support and um, how you can uh, get it installed and you know um, get it working. So, um, and if you want to like know more about top bar and how top bar basically works, we 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 run regular webinars and. Uh, you're more than welcome to um, register for an online webinar and uh, learn further about uh, what Tobar is and how it functions basically. Uh, but basically overall, what it really does, it once it assesses a patient based on the eligibility criteria, it would prompt you that this patient falls for a certain program. And once clicking on that particular app, you will see the relevant uh, you know, material regarding your patient and regarding and regarding that app. So jumping onto the live program app, uh, what the app does. So I basically uh, identifies patients while in consultation. So if you have a patient in your consultation who for, uh, who uh, you know falls of uh, has um, fulfills the criteria, eligibility criteria for live program, uh, so and then uh, Topa would identify those patients and then would prompt. So it would identify the relevant pathology requirements for the referral process. It would track and achieve practice goals for health assessment and prevention activities. And then uh, going forward would you know, achieve quality improvement practice goals as well. So this is a sample overview screenshot of the app. Uh, I apologize if it looks a bit uh, too, uh, you know, um, 
too much information on the screen right now, but just to just to you know give you the feel what would app look like and what it does contain. So the, basically the app once you click on. So if I go back to the screen again, if you see this live uh, logo, this would what would appear on top bar. So that would be the uh, app logo. Once you click on the app logo, you would uh, see this window. And in this window, you would have three panels. So there was first panel talks about the CBD risk calculation, the absolutely cardiovascular risk calculator. So these uh, fields, uh, as much as possible, would be auto-filled. Uh, where you know Papa can pull up the data from the CIS, it can autofill it. Uh, otherwise, there are certain questions which are not present in the CIS, and you have to manually enter it. For example, you know, um, have you, for example, uh, some questions in the diabetes risk assessment, which I will talk in a moment. So, um, I would, so, so in the first panel, we have the absolute cardiovascular risk calculation where which would enter, um, you would see pre-filled information and you can even modify that information as well. Um, it talks about the age, the gender, the triglyceride status, um, if you had an ECG done and et cetera. Um, then we would have a section that would talk about uh, that uh, list the relevant pre-existing conditions. So it would include all the conditions that Eleni had been sharing in her slides. Um, for example, uh, PCOs, pre-diabetic conditions, a familiar hypercholesteremia, uh, et cetera. Um, the next section will also show you active patient diagnosis. So uh, your patient, whatever diagnosis your patient has, an active diagnosis would be listed there. So there's a clear snapshot of your patient, what he already has. Um, then we have the diabetes risk assessment, the OSG risk calculator. And when you further expand this, you would see that on the side panel, I have the questions and how it would show on the app. And as I was mentioning earlier, most of the fields are auto-populated, but then we have questions like, have you ever been found to have high blood glucose, et cetera. There are certain questions that are, um, uh, the certain or question like we eat vegetables or fruit every day, certain questions that are, that cannot be auto populated from CIS. So these questions you need to uh, fill in and then press the calculate button. And then you would see the score on the middle panel. Uh, pressing the reset button would of course reset the entire calculator and then you can fill in the information again. So going back to the middle panel, as I was talking, the middle panel talks about the score itself. So we have the cardiovascular risk assessment and the uh, diabetes risk score. So the risk assessment uh, shows you current risk at the age of 45 based on your CBD risk calculator. So uh, you know, less than 10 is low risk, 10 to 15 is medium risk, and then more than 15 is high risk. And we also have another toggle that talks about future risk at age 50 and uh, how you know in the next 10 year, um, how in the next 10, 10 years, what would be your risk of heart attack and stroke, as uh, less stroke. Uh, we then have diabetes risk score, the OSTE risk score based on the calculation we already did in the uh, so uh, you can see clearly see what is your patient's OSTE risk score and further information about it. Uh, we then have the last panel which talks about intervention options. So toggling on to each of these, for example, I would toggle on to stop smoking, improve diet, you would see how each intervention can help reduce the risk. So you, you would be able to see, you know, for example, I already have a 10% risk, uh, risk uh, CVD risk of heart attacks like stroke in the next five years and stop smoking might reduce my risk by 2%. So that's a clear uh, visual, you know, uh, representation and indication of uh, what, you what the health status of a patient would look like. Um, then we have recommendations. So recommendations are based upon the interventions uh, you would make and uh, would auto-populate about which um, and are backed by studies. Uh, we then have a section uh, which uh, uh, talks about the patient el uh, eligibility. This talks about the three eligibility criteria that Eleni had mentioned, so eligibility A, B, and C. And then we have the patient enrollment form. So once you click on the enroll button, it would open uh, the life program enrollment form. Again, uh, it would be auto filled um, to the most extent uh, and then you can discuss it with your patient and fill the rest of the 
um, you know, relevant uh, materials, and then as Alidi mentioned, um, take it to the next level. So this is basically a snapshot of what the app looks like. Um, and as I mentioned, it would be available uh, for anyone who's using best practice, uh, medical director and ZMED. And we will be running an online training. We will be doing the live demo of the app and how every button works and going through um, that as well. Going on, um, I will now talk about yeah. So with, with top bar, you see that it, it's all about opportunistic care with top bar. Your patient is present in front of you. You can see um, you can, the patient file is open in front of you and you can make the adjustment. Apologies for the background voice. So you can make adjustment at the point of care. But with CAT, CAT is more about planned care. So CAT is about identifying cohort of patients uh, in your practice. And then you have the ability with CAT to you know, recall patients or to give you a top bar prompt as well. Um, so again, if you, you know, if you wonder what, how to use CAD, uh, so we have regular webinars that uh, we run. Uh, you can definitely sign up for those webinars and we do webinars on overview of CAT or introduction to CAT as well. Uh, but this is a screenshot of CAT, what CAT looks like. And I hope uh, you all uh, have been introduced to CAT and use CAT. Um, so uh, what I want to talk about uh, regarding CAT and live program is that we have developed uh, four recipes uh, to identify patients for live program. And these recipes are up on our website. Um, and uh, we can share this presentation and I have the link for the health site as well, or you can contact Alini and so on um, for the URL as well. Um, so these uh, recipes, um, so eligibility A talks about, uh, you know, patients um, who, uh, who, you know, can be for uh, osteoarthritis score or determining what, uh, who, you know, can um, get an osteoarthritis score and then are eligible for life program. And then we have, you know, risk criteria A, uh, a and B and C. And this talks about how you can use CAT to identify these patients. So if I quickly, um, just give me a second, I'll quickly show you our help site. So this is basically our help site and you see we have the live program and we have the uh, four recipes and just going through risk criteria B, for example, you see in, um, uh, it's very clearly documented what you need to do uh, in CAT. So once you open CAT, uh, where do you need to go? Um, uh, just clearly mention what is the eligibility criteria, for example, for um, uh, risk criteria B. So this age 30 years and above for uh, Aboriginal tourists and lenders or age 40 years or above for general population and um, CVD risk score 10% or above. So then I have step-by-step -step guide on this help page on how to you know, identify this cohort of patients in CAT. And you can follow this recipe. And once you have you know, selected all this criteria and finally have the list of patients who then have the ability to you know, send them an SMS recall, voicemail recall, and have the, uh, the ability to recall these patients. And once these patients are back in your clinic, you then can use top bar and uh, you know, understand uh, and then um, do the live program and enroll those patients and so on. So they, so now CAT and TOPA work together and create the whole clinical workflow for you. Um, another, you know, additional thing that CAT can uh, um, perform or do would be that you have the ability that once you have exported this patient list, you have the ability to create a TOPA prompt. So once this particular patient from the list would come to your clinic, it's in front of you, Tauber will prompt you that please perform, uh, you know, uh, the please do, uh, please enroll the patient for life program or however you want to prompt to be named and so on. So there are multiple ways that a pen, um, so CAD and Tauber can help you and your practice um, work towards life program, enrolling your patient towards life program and helping uh, managing them um, uh, with their diabetes uh, and you know, situation, uh, preventing them as well. It's all about preventive care for us here at Penn. Um, in the end, I would just like to touch base with our data governance. 
and security issues, we here at Penn are very strict with our data governance and clinical governance a framework and guidelines, and we follow strict guidelines in terms of our apps and our reports and so on. Um, we are aligned with all the privacy acts um, and ISO 27001 as well. We have a clinical advice committee and pencils data governance committee, which is led by clinical practitioners. So in the end, just to finish it off, um, contact us. So if you need any help, any assistance, any questions regarding the life programs or pen in general, uh, you can um, contact Manfred, who is the account manager who is dealing uh, with the life program or in also contact our support team. Our support team is available nine to five uh, Sydney time. Uh, you can email them or call them. Uh, my apologies, they, they switched email and phone. Um, but, and so if in case you uh, do not have uh, Catalyst in, installed at your practice, uh, October not installed, uh, please contact our support team. There's a booking link as well. You can make the booking and our support team is more than happy to install it for you and take it further. And as I mentioned earlier as well, we have a webinar and we're going to have a, a training as well to go through the live app, um, you know, step-by-step -step guide as well. So this is all for my presentation. Please um, do put in your questions uh, in chat or you can you know, ask me anything. Thank you so much, Shafia. That was just a brilliant overview of what PenCat can really do in drilling down and support it drilling down into patient um, databases and supporting that um, activity and QI um, uh, systems changes to find patients at risk either retrospectively for life or at the point of care. So thank you very, very much. I am going to see if I can get the screen sharing back. Let me have a look. I yes, think I've got it. Yes, I can. Somebody Thank said, you. there we go. Excellent. Uh, we're coming to up towards the discussion part. We've been through the uh, top bar release and there are your project officers will talk through with you some of the other pen recipes that can help um, in the um, activities of PDSAs for the project. There's quite a few of them and this is not all of them. It's really, as I think um, Ralph pointed out in the beginning, it's about what works for the practice team, finding those, those areas where you want to start making changes and then blending some of those recipes together and moving through um, the activities. So I will ask um, if there's any questions and we can start a discussion with Ralph, myself and anybody else who would like to um, get the ball rolling perhaps. And of course, do remember it is uh, the Heart National Heart Week. So if you, hence the, the red shirt, and I'm sure, I'm, I'm surprised Kerry didn't say anything, but um, yeah, and remember there's some great resources that you can get from the Heart Foundation, as well as from Diabetes Victoria. I'm talking around posters, pamphlets, um, and all sorts of ideas. So uh, use them. Now, there was someone waving a hand. Who was that? This is me, Sasha. Ah, oh, Sasha. Hi, how are you? Good night. How good what can we do for you? you? So I just wanted to ask, uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, we are running a bulk fill uh, practice and we use a hot dog to send uh, messages to our patients, like notify them if they are eligible for the health assessment, heart check, and other uh, assessments. But uh, the thing is that uh, regarding the funding, it's, uh, you know, if we want to send message to all of the uh, patients, it's gonna cost us a lot. Is there any credit, uh, you know, for us? Or is there any other way that, the, you know, we can uh, use to, you, you know, because if the staff wants to call them, first of all, Receptionists need, uh, they need education. 
okay? They need education to be able to, you know, how to talk with the patient in order to find out if they want to come for assessment or not. And, and it's very time consuming. So if there is any, you know, any fund for us or because for, I think for each SMS is gonna cost us four cents if we go to the hot dog and uh, the hot dog send two messages like one week apart. And after that, it's gonna uh, prepare a letter for us. Yeah, yes. that's what that's my question. Unfortunately, Sasha, there isn't any funding as a part of this program for the recall mm -hmm. and reach out for patients. But we're certainly very happy to take on, you know, as um, a PHN subscripted dialogue that could help mm -hmm. with. Um, oh, yes, that would be great. Help with some of that reach out for reception. Yeah, one of the, the most effective ways that we found was, in fact, our practice nurse reaching out to our patients and talking to them. So you don't phone 100. You, you pick your yes. five or 10 and you get the practice nurse to phone them and say, look, you know, Dr. Autumn's asked me to give you a phone call because after your last blood test, he wanted to talk to you about preventing diabetes. So what we'd like to do is get you to come in and rah, rah, rah. And we find that personal approach was far better than letters. Letters just don't work, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, SMS does work for some of our patients, but again, at the end of the day, we found that personal touch, especially for our older cohort, just worked far better. Yes. And I think it's fair to say too, it, it's this is about early prevention. So sending out SMS messages may be a little alarming if you're asking people to come in to have your heart health check, it's, I think as Ralph has said, it's, it's, it needs some nuance and some delicacy in recalling the patients. Uh, and I think certainly to see them effectively go through to a referral as well, perhaps. But let me say, you've got a brains trust here. Are there any GPs who have done a recall program like this and found that, what did they find work really well? Yeah, uh, Atef. Yeah, hi, thanks. Thanks, Rolf. It's a great presentation from everyone, as usual. Uh, look, um, I've got a few comments, and I will may start with your um, the last question from Sasha uh, regarding the, the text messages. Uh, yes, it costs, but um, it's, again, you need to factor in as well that the patient would come in and see the GP, and you might charge for heart health check or uh, for um, health assessment. Uh, other, um, I was involved. I'm involved actually with the Heart Health Check um, or the National Heart Foundation for Heart Health, Health Check, and you need to make sure that you're um, actually you're very um, cautiously just the language um, appropriate uh, mess messages here because a lot of patients get these messages. Uh, get very. Um, um, we found it maybe. Uh, the patients get very uh, anxious about um, these messages. Um, am I having a heart attack? Or so you be very careful with the language uh, or the text text messages you you send to the patients. Uh, I may invite you to maybe get involved with the uh, uh, um, perhaps the heart health check uh, uh, messages and nudge me messages we do, and this has been. Um, tested and those text messages been tested i'm happy to pass it on to you guys to uh, uh maybe that might help as well to invite patients uh, or high risk patients um, my other comment as well is um back to uh the last speaker i was shafia shafia uh regarding the cardiovascular calculator uh, we're actually, I I'm involved as well in the, uh, the last, the, the ongoing the cardiovascular guidelines now. And I think there's a new calculator coming in soon. Yes. So you be in aware. June. Yeah, yes. in June. So yes. uh, be aware there's some few, few other points as well on this cardiovascular calculator. So just to make sure that we're not confusing patients or the GPs as well. So be, uh, be uh, like, keep, uh, keep, keep your eye uh on that uh, calculator coming soon in, in June. Yes. Uh, um, uh, po possibly more of an education or uh, spread the word with um, or GPs or actually uh, to get, um, am I still on or? 
Yeah, no, you still going. We can hear you. We're, we're listening with bated breath. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So um, just more, more of, um, uh, more of uh, spread the word to um, different GP, uh, what GPs are, are there for mainly for primary prevention, and it's um, it's actually very. Um, very sad to see uh, patients who are still getting uh, heart attacks for very preventable uh, reasons, uh, as as Rolf said as well. So um, we try hard to get as much as we can from high cardiovascular risk. Uh, usually GPs are um, really busy, and uh, so I think it's a the key issue here is a teamwork with uh, practice managers, receptionists. Um, and the nurses as well. Um, that would be possibly the key, um, the key issue here with uh, getting more patients to our, uh, to the practice get assist. Um, last, um, I remember the last word is uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanted. Ah, uh, there's uh, uh, with a life program. There's any way to get um, to get uh, like a one stop shop to, like. A, uh, from nutrition, physical activity, and smoking cessation, because we find like patients who actually uh, obese can can be the same time as a small. They are smoker, they are drinker. Can we get this is all in one one stop shop instead of having sending patient or referring patient to life? This is for Elaine. Uh, mm -hmm. If we can send patient for um, uh, for dietitian, I use as a physiologist and. As well, perhaps uh, for smoking cessation and and and, and etc. So, is, is it any way to get that in under the life program? Well, yeah, very, good. <laughs> very good question. Uh, we are going through program redevelopment at the moment, so we are always updating the program in line with evidence. At the moment, I don't believe it is included, but we do triage patients to services that they do require. So, just say if your patient. Um, is identified as being a smoker. So we do quite a few questionnaires with them to identify, you know, their specific lifestyle, um, well, what they're currently doing or not doing to increase their risk. They will then chat to them about specific resources and um, websites they can attend to encourage them for that smoking cessation. So it's not specifically part of the program and education, but it is there and acknowledged by the health professional because they do have that one-on-one -on -one, um, individualized session with them at the start to assess all their needs and triage them accordingly. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, Eleni, with the, the phone um, life program, yes. uh, don't, don't you sort of work out goals with the patient? Yes. What they want. So if they identify smoking, you would help them with that, wouldn't you? Um, I think they would, they would definitely educate them, but also um, provide them to, they would triage them to the, to the quit, okay. system, to yep. quit and, and whatnot. So we do have, um, we're linking them to a lot of the services um, that they do require. But also just to note, Ralph, um, we do SMART goals with group course and with telephone health coaching. Yeah. So it's all underpinned by behaviour change. Yep, absolutely. That's why I love it. Thanks, Ellie. Thank you. I was just wondering, I'm a GP in Footscray, where the nearest life program would be, and is there a very long wait to get patients into the programs? And thanks, everybody, for all the information. It's been great. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the question. So we can definitely have a look. Unfortunately, um, from the top of my head, I don't know the closest provider to you, but I do believe we do have a provider near Footscray. Um, and that would be for the in-person group course. Um, I might not have specified in my presentation, but we also do provide the group course online via Zoom as an option. Um, and we do have the telephone health coaching service, but rest assured, I am nearly 100% sure we have a provider near Footscray and I can touch base, base with you offline to let you know who that Well, is. I just happened to Google live Footscray and you've got co-health providing oh, it within Footscray. Go. Ralph, you're too good. Thank you. I also good do it in know. Braybrook. Thank you. But it's interesting. Um, I, I like the idea that the phone or individual 
counselling or life program actually worked a little bit better than the face-to-face, -face, which I think is fantastic because that course can be delivered anywhere. Definitely, but I think um, we do need to interpret the results with some caution too, because with group course, you've got the health professional there, um, of course, measuring the anthropometry and the like, but over the phone, you are um, also reliant on self-reporting. So I think they're both really great methods, but yeah, we do have to be cautious there as well. I'm wondering if any practices are going to be brave enough to jump in with what they think might be their initial activities to get started in the project. I'll let it hang there for a little bit. Somebody might get brave if there's another comment though, because I think I might have cut somebody off somewhere there. Uh, look, just one more, uh, one more question is, um, is there any any like any of, of one of your teams like um, has an Aboriginal health worker? Because uh, I think we might need to have uh, Aboriginal health worker in in the team to get in touch with um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients. Do you well, I'm, not, well? I'm going to put the hard word on there, Lenny. Do we still have an Aboriginal liaison officer at Diabetes Vic? That's a really great question, Ralph. <laughs> um, we do have the Life Road to Good Health program, which is for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but it has been, um, I guess, we haven't been practicing it for a while. So I do have to liaise with specific staff members um, to know more about what we are doing with that um, side of the program. I was just uh, saying we used to have a um, an Aboriginal um, liaison officer actually employed in uh, Diabetes Victoria so that you could talk to them about ways of engaging with your local community. But I'm sure the PHN must have some resources as well. Yes, yes, we do. Um, sorry, there. I'm, I'm just getting a bit of drag in the background there, but I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, Yes, we do have um, Aboriginal uh, and Aboriginal um, program officers who can help support. Is are you thinking, Doctor Atef, for helping with the recall patients to practice? Is that what I'm uh, hearing? Pretty, pretty much recall and management as well, so and follow up because. Um, yeah, I think it's um, it's it's we don't have that on in our practice, but uh, or, and I think it's a lot of practices maybe a lack of those um, Aboriginal health workers or nurses. So we might need your the PHN uh, sort of support if we have uh, to um, invite Aboriginal health uh, uh, Aboriginal people. Yeah, we can certainly help. Yes, make some connections. Um, from PHN to your practice, we'll take that on board. Yeah. And if you ever get a chance to do, um, you know, so, so that sort of cultural training around Aboriginal health, I once went to the Aboriginal Foundation and gosh, they, they do this afternoon where they take you on a journey of, of Aboriginal life as it was from the beginning to is now. And it's actually quite confronting, but it's a great way to get an insight into, the, into their journey. So sure. that cultural awareness training is really worthwhile. Absolutely. Yep. Oh, I hate silence. It always I always have to break first. I'm, but I'll, <laughs> I'll. <laughs> But yeah, are there any I mean, I'm sure some of the practices must have done something around this. Is there something that someone done that worked really well that they'd like to share? Well, our practice is involved in the, uh, in phase one with um, heart health check, and we invited a, lo a lot of like uh, people when um, through text messages um, to get uh, to get them to be like uh, check, like uh, for the heart health check, and we found it as a lot like um, uh, a lot of people came and um, there's a very positive feedback from uh, the heart health check and. Uh, like, um, especially when ca calculated cardiovascular. Though the, initially the GPs or in our practice were um, initially re very reluctant to do that. And they 
uh, already busy, but um, we found that it's very, um, uh, very like it's worth it to do that. Uh, so they started just to get the, uh, uh, to invite people to get um, get cardiovascular assist and um, and managed. So okay. our feedback is very positive for this. Now we've done some in our practices and um, I think I agree that the scripts are really important because it's quite good to, people do respond to the recalls, but then that initial call, I think is quite important. Um, and also having an endpoint of being able to refer them to the life program is also another uh, benefit of, of the whole thing. So it's not kind of just left up in the air. Um, and I think Ralph, you know, you've got a good um, suggestion to have, you know, small targeted, um, and regular um, recalls, which I think is doable in a practice. Now, we were, we're worried that if we sent out 100 invites and then if 60 turned up, you know, what was our practice nurse going to do? And so we thought, no, no, we'll start really small and just let them, so it was a manageable sort of type approach. I wonder if there's any questions coming through through the chat, Steph. No, everybody's going very quiet at 7.42. Well. This. Sorry, just one of the things we've done in our practice is um, in some stage we allocated um, few spots over the week for each, each doctor to um, to uh, recall the patients for heart health check. So that might, uh, so the patient comes for heart health check and he knows and he's aware and the doctor is aware about this is for heart health check. So, and definitely the blood test will be done before, be, prior. So, um, and that's, I think the pink cat as well helped, helped uh, a lot for uh, to identify those patients or with a high risk. So, uh, yeah, so allocations, um, pay, uh, patient allocation for a few patients every every week for each doctor. That that's what we've done before. So I think I we found it is quite positive as well. So how did you get that started? Did you, um, if I'm hearing correctly, you put into the calendar for the blocked out a session for doctor to review those patients, maybe say three in a week, different yeah. doctors. But then how did you find those patients? Was was the doctor actively looking for their patients that they thought would have mm. risk factors that warranted? So would they were using a pen recipe, maybe mm. the one of the one you know that suite of um, recipes that we had up on the board? Would that be the best a good way for practices to perhaps start thinking about it for next yeah. week? I think I can see Namarata as well. Our practice manager want to jump in, but <laughs> <laughs> but I think what we've done um, is identify uh, we uh, we identify the patients who are with high risk or high cardiovascular risk, and then we invited them uh, through um, a text messages and uh, through the heart health check, and um, when they respond back, we allocated as and we had an icon on uh, each doctor um, um, waiting room is uh, an icon with heart health check for these patients. So they come, they they are aware that they're going to be assessed for heart health and uh, they're going to hear from the doctor. So the doctor will be uh, prepared and the, 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 and, and it's allocated time for uh, usually um, it's half an hour, like a half an hour consultation or uh, long consultation for the doctor and the patient. So I think this worked for, uh, initially very well for the patients and, and, and the doctors are, are the same as well. So um, <laughs> any comment, Namarata? <laughs> um, sorry, just to jump in. So um, what worked for us, we created an appointment type, which was a green apple for heart health check. And we sent 10 SMS per doctor within our practice to aim three minimum appointments per week per GP. So they had three heart health appointments and they could see that I have half an hour blocked for patient A Smith as an example. And the nurses would then work in the background to see this is what we need per GP done and allocated. Um, and then patients who are obviously regular patients of their GPs, um, 
believed and you know mm -hmm. uh, relied on you know their relationship that they had to come in um and that worked and as you know ralph mentioned in the you know one of the few um sessions one of once that he mentioned that that personal touch over the phone helped when the patients were booked so that helped us um but we were targeting like small audience at a time to get them in the clinic and that's how it was a success in the first phase you know, it's interesting. We did something very similar in Broadmeadows. We now this a lot of GPs are going to freak when they hear this. The first hour after lunch was always blocked off for planned care. Now, if in the morning the nurses hadn't booked anyone into it, it was then opened up. So you then had patients who could be squeezed in. But you know what it allowed the nurses to do is to then get someone in to do their health assessment or whatever, and then they could book them in and they always had a slot and of course it just improves the viability of your practice no end so it was a win-win um i just wanted to say what a great example and, and ralph i love your analogy of you know you can't eat an elephant at once like of the whole and i think namarata's and and dr atif's example is you know really it's it's that in practice of you know, 10 patients, what a manageable amount to, to, to trial something like this. So, yeah. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, is there any way to, for, uh, for the health assessment, if you want to, for example, call patients for the uh, heart health check, so, uh, because some of the, our patients, they visit other practices, okay? And if we want to clarify exactly, are they eligible to that health assessment? We have to call Medicare for each one of them. Is there any other way that we can find out they are eligible for the health assessment? Well, we use Proda. You know, you can log on to Proda and you can check it that way. Your voice got disconnected. Can't hear you. Yeah, what is it? What does it want us to do? Because our nurses log on to Proda and check uh, whether people are eligible. You can put in the item number and it'll tell you whether they're eligible for it or not. Um, we found that a little bit easier than phoning. Is that what everyone else does? Yes, uh, I think so. Certainly in my experience, yeah. I think the, the phone through services being disbanded, I think. I so we've got right to... Yes, because I fact like uh, information for 100 patients and they never get back to me. And my doctor, GP, always busy and his door always closed. So I was thinking to just open a product, product I can for myself. We can jump in and on, on uh, the doctor's product and found uh, the patient is eligible. Mm -hmm. Putting in mind that as well, um, heart health check item number is um, is not valid if the patient has uh, a health assessment being done in the same year. So either mm -hmm. either health assessment or a heart health check, check in the same year. Okay. okay. Yeah. So product can help you with that. Okay. Thank you. So this is what we call peer group learning. We're learning from each other. And because most of us have done this before or bits and pieces of it. So this sort of sharing um, makes it easy. So don't be shy if you've done something that's worked really well. Just please share because it, it's just so important. And also just I, my last question. So to start with, for example, if you want to start from tomorrow, so I'm going to uh, just, you know, I just want to know if I understand everything quite well. So I'm going to start with the CAT4, yes, to gather, co you know, the cohort, uh, you know, uh, for the patients. And then uh, we have to, uh, I have heard about two apps. One of them, it was um, uh, the pen, the pen, and another one, I, I forgot about that. So. Uh, is it really uh, uh, the, the other app is was for the life life program 
So is it really important to have uh, both of the apps? Pen, just, pen to, just to clarify, sorry, I'm from Pen. Just to clarify, Pen is our larger company, and then we have two softwares. We have Top Bar, and then we have CAT4. So CAT4 mm -hmm. is our clinical audit tool, which gives you a cohort of patients. And Top Bar is basically yeah. Um, at the point of care, a decision support tool. So the two, so the life program sits, the life program app sits on top bar, and with CAT four, you have the ability to find a cohort of patients you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so what you know, so right. what you're saying Thank is you. the first step is that we want to find out who we're going to tackle, and so you might say, right, you know, have a chat to your GP about what he wants to search for. But you might say, right, I want to use the CAT4, all people who have an A1C between 6 and 6.5 who don't have a diagnosis mm -hmm. of diabetes. And you call them yes. in and you look at them where you get your nurse to check them. Um, and, you know, most of all, well, a lot of them won't have diabetes. So they'll all be, because they're pre-diabetes, they'll automatically be eligible for life. But you've got a couple of recipes mm -hmm. that Penn have provided. So, you know, you, you know, sit on one of their sessions so you can learn to run them really quickly. Um, and that will give you wonderful lists that you can then divide up however you want to and start calling them in. But then you're going to have to do what are you going to do when they come in? So you need to think about that step too. Awesome. But that's what the PDSAs are all about. Yes, thank you so much. Definitely, and also, um... Shafir, correct me if I'm wrong. So the top bar app with the life program um, will actually help your GPs and practice nurses identify your patients live when they're consulting if they're eligible for the program. So through the eligibility A, B or C that I went through. So the OSD risk or the absolute cardiovascular disease calculation score, all those pre-existing conditions. So there's also that method of identification um, and prevention through that life program top R app on top of the cat four recipes as well for that retrospective recall. And Marie, I think the PHN have support workers to come that they can visit the practice to help people work this way, way through this sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. A lot's been done by Zoom, but certainly uh, we can certainly touch back to those recipes that are a part of this um, presentation. And maybe if I just try and share my screen again. Uh -oh. Uh oh, yeah, I know. Everyone <laughs> hold on to your hats, hey? Here we go. Um, ba -ba. And oh, don't you love it when they grow in confidence, these boomers? Look at them. There we go. Now, uh, can everybody see that? No. Oh, no. I think you've turned your uh, video uh, uh, off. Uh, yes, I have because I have to go back here. And here we go. Yep. So hopefully this is coming through now. Yes. And these are some of the other recipes that um, – will help identify those patients in the first um, instance. So you've got identifying patients who are eligible for a heart health check and a GPMP, identifying patients uh, with heart check diagnosis of gestational diabetes, patients eligible uh, with risk, high risk um, patients. So there really are quite a suite of um, recipes that you can go through and drill down to find those patients that you're going to start bringing into practice. Does that help at all? It is very helpful. Thank Excellent. You. We will be sharing these um, this slide deck uh, as soon as we can, which will, let's be fair, probably Monday. And we will, I'll try and get a nice presentation of the life program from Alini. So it's not looking um, speckly. And we will have Penn's fabulous um, presentation as well. Um, Marie, if I 
wanted to jump in, in just in terms of um, Ralph's comment around um, the PHN support as part of this program. We at the program officers will touch base with your practice to help you map out, okay, what, what can be your first step? What you know, and work through the thinking part of the and the planning part of the plan, do, study, act cycles that Ralph touched on um, in the session earlier. So um, definitely if your practice is, is confident and feels like um, you're ready to, to kick off and, and can begin this planning and um, testing some improvement ideas. But if you're unsure um, or where to start, that's when we can definitely support in that QI coaching on stepping you through, okay, let's start here and, and um, what your plan can be for your improvement activities. Exactly. Thank you, Steph. And yes, we'd be delighted to to walk you through those um, those pen recipes and in that PDSA cycle and yep, get prepared for the second workshop, which will be with us in sometime in August to be confirmed. I think my timepiece is telling me it's 7.56 and I think we might have all... Well, before you go, there was a question about life program in Wyndham, and again, I, on the on the website, I googled it, and they they've got one there, Wyndham City Council, with uh, forty five Princess Highway and a phone number. So I assume there must be already a program there. Brilliant, Ralph. We do have a few providers in the Wyndham area. Oh, there you go. See, yep. it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are in most LGAs in Victoria, which is great. <laughs> Fantastic. Is everybody happy if we call it a close tonight? Let me see. We can get to the oh, uh, one last slide. So okay. thank you very much, guys. Have a good night. Oh, thank you for attending. Excellent. So next steps is to complete the pre-pilot survey. If you haven't already done it, please. Baseline data collection, as Steph and myself have said, will be out um, and contacting and connecting with practices to get those ideas started, uh, to get those ideas going and then set those data points, as Ralph had said earlier on, you know, see how many CVDs uh, you did in a time span, let's start, you know, we might go back two months, say, see if you've done any, and then from the project start, see in two months if there's a change there. Pen CS data recipes and top bar, as I said, we'll be sharing those with um, with the practices as we come out or Zoom in to support you. And template referral, we will issue a template referral, which will ask you to monitor how many patients are being referred to lifestyle risk modification programs as a part of your activities in this project. I think that really does bring us to the thank you for your time slide. And I hope everybody has a lovely evening and weekend to kick off in a day. So good evening and happy preventing. <laughs> Fantastic, Ralph. Good evening. <laughs> all right. Good night, all. Good night.